We're now recording. Very good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, the January 19th meeting of the State Bar Finance Committee. Um, Ms. Harvey, can I have you uh, call the roll, please? Broughton? No. Yes. Here. Doyle? Present. Tony? Present. We have a quorum. Very good. And um, Ms. Harvey, when, uh, when Mr. Broughton uh, returns, would you please make sure that you also record him as, as being present when he when he, when he uh, arrives. Uh, thank yes. you. Um, uh, next on the agenda is, is the opportunity for public comment. Uh, I don't think we have anyone that has signed up previously uh, for, for public comment, but would like to make note that uh, if you are on Zoom, uh, if you use the raise your hand function, uh, that will allow you to be recognized. Uh, if you are calling in, if you use the star nine function, that'll allow you to be recognized. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, uh, we generally provide public commenters with about three minutes uh, for their public comments. Uh, Ms. Harvey, uh, anybody in the queue for, for public comment? Yes, we do have one hand raised, um, Todd Hill. Very good, very good. Uh, Mr. Hill, good morning to you. And whenever you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Soule. Thank you very much for uh, providing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, thanks to the committee and, and Happy New Year to those I have a prior address. And I think I've already said that to you uh, this year, Mr. Soule. So uh, forgive me. I'm not trying to be rude. <laughs> At any rate, um, my, my um, conversation really is about this notion of uh, uh, the bar's uh, concerns related to its solvency and it's an uh, impending insolvency if, if critical action isn't taken. And one of the things I, I really do encourage uh, is really looking at um, the more traditional role of regulator um, in the state of California and, and how uh, departments like the uh, CDFA, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, right? Uh, all these things function in a way where uh, they charge fees. Uh, some of those fees are annual fees, uh, but those really are just the baseline uh, for your participation in an enforcement program, in an enforcement regime. And um, just like the Department of Toxic Substances has, you know, both federal and state laws and, and a mechanism to you know, test against whether or not a uh, particular site is contaminated or exceeds particular levels of, of X, Y, or Z. Uh, the bar has very, very clear, very, very clear tests for, for wrongdoing. It has very, very clear tests and clear sets of laws to look at larger firms. The vast majority of uh, reports I see on the bar's websites are, are closures of individual practices or folks who shouldn't even have practices because they don't have degrees or whatever it takes uh, to be a member. That's ridiculous. That's just sort of one-on-one. -on -one, uh, in fact, I'm sorry that there's more staff attorneys probably assigned than just one during the whole process. So the reality is it's just beating up on the little guy. And of course you can't generate adequate revenue in that, that approach. You have reality, 30 seconds. Oh, thank you, ma'am. The reality is that the role of the regulator is to regulate and enforce. And that enforcement is not just beating up on the little guy. It's going after the, the big guys, you know, like the famous ones in the world. Thank you. Mr. Hill, uh, thank you for your comments, and uh, I hope you stick around for some of the deliberations of the of the finance committee because uh, I think some of that will be uh, some of what you discussed. Uh, we we may be deliberating as well. Um, 
Ms. Harvey, anything else? Any, anyone else in the queue for, uh, for public comment? There are no other hands raised at this time. Very good, very good. Um, Ms. Harvey, if you would, uh, I note the presence of uh, Mr. Broughton in the room. Uh, so we could record him as being present. <laughs> Noted. I appreciate it. Um, uh, next on the agenda is the chair's report. Uh, I don't do not have a, a chair's report today, but uh, I am going to make a few remarks right before uh, item our, our first uh, official uh, item uh, for uh, for discussion and deliberation, uh, our, our budget item. So I will make a. Just a, a, a stage setting sort of comment uh, there, but no, no, uh, no chair report comment. Uh, next on the uh, agenda are uh, the minutes. Uh, we have minutes uh, before us from our November 17th, uh, 2022 meeting, as well as minutes before us from our January 6th, uh, 2023 uh, meeting. And uh, it is my understanding without objection that we could take those minutes um, uh, together as a uh, and, and vote on them uh, uh, at once, both for the November 17th and the uh, January 6th, 2023 minutes. And so if so I, moved. okay, do I have a second? I think I see Mr. Broughton's hand is a second for the minutes. You did, I forgot to push the button. No problem, Mr. Broughton. Uh, Mr. Harvey, Ms. Harvey, may I, may I have you call the roll, please? Broughton? Yes. No. Yes. Tony. Aye. Soel. Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Very good. Um, uh, members, right before I turn it over to uh, Ms. Montoya Chico and uh, Ms. Wilson for the presentation of, uh, of the budget item, uh, I just thought it might be good just to, to quickly, very quickly, just sort of set the stage as to where it is that we are. Um, and, and what we have before us today. Uh, members, as, as you know, um, and as you may recall, at our January 6th meeting, uh, we considered the board's budget. And at that time, we were apprised of a, a significant shortfall in both our general fund and in our admissions fund uh, at that time. And staff presented us with uh, a number of different uh, options uh, for closing uh, of that short, shortfall and help to, sh to solve for that, uh, uh, that, de uh, that deficit. Uh, mm -hmm. But at that time, however, um, uh, we directed our staff to come back to us with some additional uh, budget solution sort of scenarios uh, that we would deliberate uh, at the meeting, uh, at our meeting today, uh, as well as at that time, I think per a discussion that was initiated by Mr. Tony, uh, that we, um, uh, we indicated that as a committee, we would like to put forward to the full board a single preferred budget solution um, uh, to the full board for their discussion. Uh, I think later, uh, later today or tomorrow, whatever we, whenever we get to it, and then sort of a final vote um, at a subsequent, uh, subsequent board meeting. So I think I've, I, I think I have that right, um, and. Uh, uh, we do have a significant task before us today. And so uh, with, uh, with that preamble, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Montoya Chico and, and, uh, and Ms. Wilson for us to, uh, uh, to start in on, uh, on item A. All right. Uh, thank you, Arnie. Uh, so good morning, uh, Finance Committee members. I will start off uh, the presentation to discuss our, our 2023 budget and the different scenarios that we were asked to develop. Uh, with me here is also Justin Ewart. He's our finance manager who has, uh, who oversees the budget process. Um, so he's he's here to uh, help answer any questions um, in addition to, to Leah. So I do have a presentation and I'm gonna share my screen. So just let me know when you see it. Do you, is my screen, can you guys see my screen? Good. Okay. So um, as Arnie was saying, at the uh, January 6th Finance Committee meeting, we were asked to develop um, three scenarios. Uh, and I will be going through each each one of the three scenarios that we've developed. The first one being uh, the one that I presented at, at uh, two weeks about two weeks ago, which is, you know, user reserves of about $5 million. 
Um, then we were asked to develop two more, one that had less reserve spending, one that had more reserve spending. So these are going to be scenarios two and three. And I will go into what are the assumptions for each of the scenarios and how we were able to develop them. Uh, we will also go into, you know, in each of the scenarios, in your attachment A, there's uh, several, several uh, schedules on IT uh, expenditures. So we will go into uh, the details of, of those as well. And then the only uh, action item in this agenda is um, its request for spending authority. Um, since we're going to be adopting the budget in February, uh, we do need additional spending authority for the month of uh, February. So this, this is the only action item from this agenda that I will cover as part of my presentation. So the first budget scenario uh, that I will go into is kind of a refresher. And this is the one that I had presented um, at the January 6th Finance Committee meeting. There's uh, some minor tweaks we did to it, but generally, but this is for the most part, what, what I presented, and this is what I'm calling scenario one. Um, and this is this is the baseline scenario that we use to then develop scenarios two and three that you will see in my um, subsequent slides. Uh, so this scenario is uh, the one where we're using roughly $5 million of reserves. Um, and these are the assumptions that we incorporated into this scenario. So we have, you know, the recently negotiated COLA fully funded for the general fund. Uh, we have six, uh, 15, excuse me, per, uh, percent in salary savings, and that's been based on our uh, historical trends. We reduced, um, or we we budgeted for uh, sub entity meetings to be uh, two in person and board meetings for four. Uh, other than Jenny, Jenny's the only sub entity that actually needs 100% in person. So we budgeted them still at 100% in person, but we reduced their meetings from two days to one days. Uh, we also have funding of uh, IT IT spending for core operations uh, that we that we need you know just to run the basic uh, IT IT operations and there is uh, limited funds uh, that we did budget uh, for infrastructure security and some strategic plan initiatives. Um, there's funding for one MAD uh, external auditor, which was you know recommendation from the state auditor. Um, this this is the budget that also assumes uh, only six months worth of a. Uh, uh, San Francisco building costs. And obviously that was made with the assumption that we would sell the building in the second part of 2023. So we only budgeted for six months. Uh, we do have four uh, new OCTC positions budgeted in this scenario. Um, we have some work budgeted to support access and DEI work. That work is typically funded by grants, but there is a portion that is funded by the general fund. Um, we also have uh, some staff training and communications uh, uh, spending in this budget. Uh, we did incorporate uh, something that wasn't there in the January 6th, uh, this particular budget was staff travel. So we've incorporated about 100,000 of staff travel in, in this budget. Um, and then we did eliminate one vacant position. Uh, and then a second position, we only budgeted for six months. So with those savings, we were able to uh, fund a few other things like the staff, the staff travel, for example. So... This is what I'm calling the baseline scenario. And as I go into my scenario two and three, keep these assumptions in mind because the uh, the second and third scenario are gonna be either reductions of or in addition to these assumptions. So the next scenario we were asked to develop was one where we use less reserves. Um, so this scenario number two, uh, we basically say are saying, we're only gonna use about a third of our reserve. Uh, so that's about $3 million. Um, again, same assumptions as uh, scenario one, except that we were able to reduce or cut uh, these five categories. Um, and the numbers that you see here are, are the savings uh, from eliminating or reducing these costs. So this, this scenario two assumes um, that we will eliminate all of the OCTC positions. Uh, and we will eliminate all of the temp and casual help uh, across all the general fund offices. Uh, we reduced our board meetings uh, from four to two times per year. Uh, and we also reduced Jenny uh, instead of meeting 100% uh, to two meetings per year. And we also reduced the staff uh, training and communications budget by the amount. All of these four or five items, uh, basically the total reductions was 1.6 million. So from the 5 million, we were able to cut about a million and a half, a little bit over a million and a half. I will say that out of the three scenarios, this is probably the most unrealistic one. One, you know, concern was raised about eliminating any OCT positions at the January 6th meeting, which, you know, this scenario does, does assume that. Um, and secondly, uh, eliminating all temp and casual help um, 
it's very, it, it would have a negative impact. It, most of the offices at the state bar actually do use temp help and casual help. Uh, for example, in, in finance, you know, during billing season, we, we've always historically had temp help. And that's because, you know, we have our 200,000 plus attorneys who are paying their annual fees over two months. And the volume is really significant that we've always had to have temp help to help us process all of those um, payments on time. IT has significant IT help that, you know, it's helping them kind of backfill some of the vacant positions. Um, OCTC is another office that uses a lot of temp help. So, you know, el eliminating that, yes, it would save us close to a million, but uh, realistically, would probably have a negative impact on on our operations and and what some of the offices are in, or how how they're intended to operate. So just you know to keep in mind. Um, the next scenario that we developed was one where we had more reserve spending. So what more could we fund, and what would that look like? So this scenario assumes uh, an eight million dollar use of reserves. Uh, and again, it's in addition to uh, our, our scenario one. Uh, so we've added these four additional uh, items to fund. Uh, one is, you know, instead, I know there was concern raised about only budgeting for six months of the San Francisco building operations because we don't know when we're going to sell the building or for how much. Uh, so this scenario assumes the entire year of, of uh, owning the San Francisco building and those operations. And in, in relation to that is your debt service payments. Obviously, we don't sell the building. We're still liable for making those debt service payments. So we have to fund the entire year. Um, we did fund in the scenario that additional, uh, those additional professional services that have been previously discussed for the 2201 program. Um, and we also have addition, additional IT uh, professional services for IT. And that basically would cover San Francisco, the San Francisco courtroom upgrade. Um, and additional investments in our refuse system. And our refuse system is, is the system that we use to transmit the debt to the franchise tax board. And these items would basically result in additional expenses of about $3.2 million, which is how we get to our roughly overall deficit of $8 million. Um, I believe it was also suggested to consider reducing salary savings from 15 to 10%. Um, so we did that and that, that change would basically result in additional personal expenses of about $4.7 million. This is not included in, in this summary table above, um, just because that that change in it of itself, you know, is almost $5 million. And that would basically not leave us with any much more room to, to uh, fund anything else. So we just wanted to kind of show you what what that change would look like. And, you know, it, it's, it's just hard to really fund anything else if we were to decrease uh, our salary savings. Um, and then we did identify a couple more items to consider in a, you know, for any of the three scenarios uh, that we could consider to cut so we can have additional savings. You know, and this could be, uh, you know, based on, on, on your guidance, you know, do we do all three? Maybe none, maybe only a, a combination of these, but not all. Um, so these are three additional uh, items that we could consider doing um, to have more savings, right? So one would be all of our vacant positions, we could just freeze them for six months, um, you know, not hire anybody for six months. Um, and then that would save us about $800,000, close to $800,000. Um, we could also cut some licensee preventative education. Um, this is basically preventative education um, for MCLE courses. We could cut that funding and this is how much savings we would have. Um, we could also cut uh, the CTAP customer service support. So these are just additional items that are not incorporated in any of the three scenarios that I shared above, but just something we could consider uh, potentially, you know, cutting. Um, and then after this, I have the spending authority. Um, so just really quick, in November, uh, we got the approval from the finance committee to uh, uh, spend uh, through the budget adoption. Uh, however, it was not to exceed $105 million. Um, and that was with the anticipation that the budget would be adopted in January. However, now that the budget is going to be adopted until the end of February, um, we do need to request additional spending um, of about $75 million, which would cover the month of February. And I know these numbers seem kind of significant, uh, but a majority of that is because we have our grant disbursements that happen you know, in the first quarter of 2023, or in the first quarter of any year. Really, so out of the 75 million, about 60 million of that uh, in February is for grant expenditures, grant disbursements. So that's why these amounts are, are what they are. Um, and that's, that's all of 
the three uh, budget scenarios. So I don't know if we want to go back and discuss. Um, so I, I think in, in whichever order you want. Yeah, I think here's what I'd like to try to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, um, uh, just try to open it up to to questions and and, and comments from uh, from members of the committee. Clearly, um, uh, the scenarios that we've uh, have been presented, we can we can mix and match from various scenarios. We can. Uh, you know, take into consideration some of the other items that were uh, were presented by Ms. Montoya Chico. Uh, I think it would be good for us to have a, a clearer understanding of what some of the IT projects are that are, that are underpinning some of these uh, scenarios as well. And so, um, uh, I don't know if there is an initial round of questions or comments from any of the members of the of the finance committee. I see your hand, Mr. Tony, and then Mr. Noel. I'll go after uh, Mr. Noll. Okay, very good. Mr. Noll. I'll go after Mr. Tony. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, uh, all right Jeff, you know. I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and go. I just had uh, kind of a process question. When we are being uh, asked to um, uh, authorize additional spending for February, under which of the three scenarios does that occur? So, so what I what I did to determine roughly how much, and it's not incorporated. It's, well, I guess you could say it would be in, in all three, and this is bar wide, right? My my seventy five million dollar request is bar wide, and I basically look at historical uh, historical trends of what we spent last year, what we budgeted uh, typically for you know, historically, uh, I do get the uh, anticipated expenditures that we that we do know are going to happen in February for grant disbursements. Um, so I look at different at different numbers, at different trends, um, and, and, you know, suggest what, what I think is the amount that we're going to spend uh, in, in, Jan in January, or in this case, February. But the grant disbursements, those, those are pretty set in stone. It's, it's the non-grant disbursements that um, I basically do look at how much we've historically spent. And, and Trustee Noel, we're trying to put everything on hold. If you're asking what scenario, we, we've placed all of like the temp hiring, all that stuff we've put on hold until we make a determination on what the budget will be. So we haven't adopted a scenario, but we're spending waiting to know what we can do. And so the spending for February does not include, does not consider either of the three any of the three scenarios. It's just what is current based on, currently anticipated to be needed based on historical spending. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Are you good, Mr. Noel? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Mr. Tony. Thank you, Chair Solo. Um, Budgets, budget's really hard. I, I know that from my own experience. My own organization is experiencing a year of a deficit budget. So I, you know, it, it's, I, I know how difficult it is. First thing I wanna do is acknowledge that I appreciate that we and the finance committee started this discussion at um, earlier in January at a special meeting of the Finance Committee. So this is not the first time that we're looking at this. And I wanna thank the staff and acknowledge the staff for developing uh, multiple scenarios for us to consider. That was one of the things that came up at, at, at that. So a couple things that I wanna reflect on. I've looked at this, I thought about it a lot. And one of the things I did to help me think about this is I went back to last year's budget and last year's uh, budgetary process. So the first thing going back, cause you know, I can't remember sometimes unless I, you know, kind of go back to my files. Um, the uh, budget for <coughs> 2022 was approved at the board meeting held February 25th, uh, 2022. And I'm only saying that because I don't think we should feel like we're behind here, okay? We did this last year where it took us till the end of February to approve the budget. So I just wanted to give that perspective, give a reminder. I couldn't remember, I had to look it up. So the other thing I did is 
um, I wanted to look at this a different way. And the way I looked at it is I looked at what we approved for the 2022 uh, budget, um, you know, this for general operating, apples to apples. And so what we approved was $94,974,000, which I'm going to call $95 million. Okay, it's so close. It's $95 million. Okay. So I thought, you know, that's in my own mind, in my own thinking, that, that's the basic point. So what, I'm, what I try to do is to change my perspective from having the starting point be um, not dipping into the reserve and having the starting point be not, um, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, looking at revenue as the baseline and looking at what last year's budget is. I know that the numbers have, aren't final for what we actually did, but I'm using the budget because it's what we approved last year. And so with this different orientation of looking at things, I noticed that the personnel expenses for last year was 81,000, I'm sorry, 81,473,000. Uh, now, if you take a minimum of 5%, and I say minimum because some employees um, are in the uh, contract agreement get 10%, but I'm going to use five because I don't know the ac actual figure, but that, that's a minimum. Well, looking at that, that would, um, you know, if we use 82,000 just as an example, that would be another uh, $4 million just in personnel increase which would, and if we froze everything else, every other category, that would bring up a uh, comparative to $99 million. Now, the only way to meet, to uh, meet any of these budgets and honor the um, contract, which we of course must do and we should do, is we take it out of personnel. We don't hire positions, we freeze them, uh, we leave positions open. And so I'm saying all this to say that um, at the moment, um, my, my, my views have evolved since the last meeting, Bec just from looking more closely at this and giving more thought to it. And I currently um, would be supportive of scenario three. I think that's the right one. Three is the one in, in, in which our uh, budget would be $99.5 million. And it's because that would be a budget that reflects the um, uh, salary adjustments, which we agreed to, and it's still an austerity budget because it basically freezes every other agenda item. So I now view the table three as an austerity budget in a way I didn't before. So I'm just sharing my thoughts, the evolution of my thinking. Um, I certainly don't no longer, even though I asked for it, even though I asked for the uh, scenar scenario two, which looked for further cuts in the presentation that the staff originally brought, I no longer support that because I believe that that kind of budget would seriously undermine the state bar's ability to meet its mission. And um, I, I can no longer support that, just giving more thought. It's not just about dollars and cents, it's about mission. And quite frankly, I'm worried about that also for scenario one, which is what the board uh, staff originally. And yes, it, it'll bring, you know, the uh, scenario three, which which I view as, le it's, a, it's really a level funding um, proposal, as far as I'm concerned. That the level funding proposal um, uh, will 
seriously, and I understand, and I don't take lightly that it would seriously, um, re you know, reduce our reserve. But it also, um, it you know, it 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 really calls the question as to how the revenue of the state bar needs to be more in line with reality, with real increased expenses that are not extravagant, that are not wasteful, and um, that, you know, we need to have some serious conversations with our funding authorities about what needs to be done going forward. And um, so I'll, I'll uh, pause there for now. Um, but I just wanted to let folks know that, that my views have evolved in this time. And this is part of why I like and I really appreciate that we're, we're being given some extra time to address and deal with very difficult subjects. Because sometimes, I, I know for myself, I just can't figure it all out at one meeting. It's just not enough time. I need time to think. And thank you for giving me some time to think. Appreciate your comments, uh, Mr. Tony. Um, Mr. Broughton, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just I wonder, you, you had some questions the last go round, and I just wondered uh, what maybe, what you might be thinking as we see these scenarios. Well, I'm not sure I can remember what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing I was thinking is that in February, uh, most of the members' um, dues come in, um, fees and so forth, because we have to have them in by March 1st. Does the budget take into account an anticipated amount that is going to be received by the members? Yeah, so... Sorry, was that? I was wanting you to answer that. The revenue. Okay. Yeah, so no, the, the revenue assumptions that we have here um, are, are incorporating how many attorneys we expect to pay, um, you know, in a year. And Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we did project a little bit of growth. Um, so it, it is incorporating what we expect to get, you know, for 2023 in revenues from those licensing fees. We projected growth over last year, but we, we actually projected to equal what last year's was so in the budget we the revenue went up by a million but we're actually thinking that the revenue is going to be flat and be similar to what we received last year yeah it's kind of interesting i mean every year so many you know thousands of people pass the bar exam so you have new people that are contributing but you also have uh, attorneys that are retiring or becoming an act that type of thing i'm just wondering if we keep growing, I would assume. We have 258, 60,000 attorneys in this uh, state. And I'm just wondering if we keep growing or are we flat or are we reducing? I, I believe that uh, the Mission Advancement and Accountability Division facilitates finance doing a revenue projection every year. And that includes looking at admissions and exits from the profession, exits those going to inactive status or over 70 who pay the inactive fee. Um, my understanding is that we have grown, but very modestly. There have been a number of attorneys that have left California during the pandemic, and we have an aging population as well. Um, but I think as Justin's indicating, um, it sounds like the actual revenue projection would suggest an increase, but we budgeted at a flat level. I think in a number of areas, our revenue projections are slightly conservative also on, on in the collections area. And I think this is appropriate, particularly given the information in the memo about the uh, the fact that our starting reserve balance may not actually quite be ten million dollars. So uh, I think we need to be, um, you know, ha have some room on the upside here for revenue to be higher than is budgeted. And, and this is kind of a byproduct. I mean, you know, um, the enrollment in law schools is probably flat. It would be the best way to say it. Um, we've all discussed the problems of fewer people going into law and uh, going to other sorts of things. And I think this maybe reflects on um, the number of attorneys that are coming into our profession. Um, 
it, it just seems like a few years ago we had a pretty good sum in our reserves, you know. Um, it's just hard to imagine for me sitting here uh, that in this period of time, a short period of time, at least the six years I've been here, uh, we've gone from, you know, many millions of dollars in our reserves uh, where we were uh, always having to spend no more than 17% to down to essentially having none unless something gets done. And that's a kind of a shame. I don't know exactly what we do about it. There's no good choices uh, at this stage. But uh, I, I, I think I would probably tend to, um, to go with scenario three only because it impacts the reserves the least that I can see. I think maybe you mean scenario one, the the three point three million dollar um, funding level out of the reserves. If you want to use the the least amount of reserves possible, okay. I just wanted to clarify. I don't I don't think we've quite had um, as healthy of reserves as as you might think we we did. We did get a one time I believe a Justin assessment to get our reserve level up to that 17%. That was part of the overall fee increase that was received for 2020 um, because the, our reserve levels were not at the 17% back then. So I think our reserves have been in a pretty um, unhealthy condition for some time. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, Justin, if you have anything more to add there. Th that's correct. In 2020, when we got our first fee increase in 20 years, three dollars uh, that year specifically was to bring the reserve levels up to the appropriate 17 percent. Three dollars of the total fee increase, and that was only one year. So, in subsequent years, we have not received that three dollars for the reserve level. Um, very good, Mr. No. Uh, yes. Just wanted to ask Justin or Leah, what is the percentage that is required? Seventeen percent, and and what are we? Where are we? The the reserve policy that the board adopted in 2016 has a minimum level of 17 percent and a maximum of 33 percent, and that's about two months worth of operating expenses. And right. this. Um, Depending on the scenario, it brings us down to around 10%, I believe, our selling. Yeah, I think so, 10 or 11%. So all the, when you look at all three scenarios, at, at some point, what the, what the highest percentage is, is 11%? You're saying, depending on what scenario we choose? I think I think depending on no, it would be lower. I, I actually don't have don't have okay. that percentage level. I have the dollar amount, right? So we have preliminary as, at the end of twenty twenty two. I think we were saying it was around ten percent at the end of twenty twenty two, right? All of these scenarios are a decrease to that. So it would be it would be less than eleven percent. You know, if we just take the preliminary, the projected ending twenty twenty two reserve balance, um, it should be around. Less than eleven percent, and, and you know I, I, we can get you those those numbers, um, well, it, those percentages. I don't think it's in, it's important necessarily mm -hmm. to get you those numbers. I think all of us you know, should know that we are technically uh, not meeting the board Correct. policy that was set in twenty sixteen. And I remember some conversation the last meeting about how um, it might be sort of <laughs> mal or misfeasance if we don't ask for more money, uh, if we don't have a plan to go to the legislature and explain to them that they have given us a lot of things to do and perhaps they ought to think about giving us the money to do it. Uh, we we want to do it. We want to do everything that we are told uh, is important from their perspective, as long as it meets our mission. And and therefore, uh, we've got a budget that doesn't have enough reserves, 
we should get an increase to bring that up to 17% at a minimum. And uh, we should uh, get an increase however they best think they can give us money. Um, I would say uh, increase the fee, these fees, but there may be other ways they can give us money that we need to do the work we need to do to do the, the IT infrastructure we need to do in order to be able to be more nimble, facile in delivering to the legislature on what they've asked us to do with uh, regulation and, and, and discipline. Um, and, and I, and I want to say for the record that I do not have a problem with, def with as, as a rule, with the deficit financing, deficit budgeting. I've done that for 25 years. And each year, almost except for two out of the 25. Those years, because of active budget management, we ended up with a surplus, not a deficit. And it's because, you know, lag time and hiring and not filling positions and all those things that, that uh, uh, make, make uh, the world the way it is. I mean, during COVID, all of a sudden there's no traveling, there's no, that was a big deal for us. It saved a lot of money. You know, I mean, every year there are things you can actively manage in the budget that allow you to beat back that deficit. I'm, uh, I am very concerned uh, that we will not be able to meet uh, what I think the majority of us see is the obligations imposed upon us by the legislature if we don't meet them on some level ground about how they've got to pay for what they want. They can't just give us a lot of do this, do that, do this, do that, and, and, and then uh, tell us, but we're not going to give you any money, and we don't care about your, your um, um, reserves. And your 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 policy on seventeen percent to thirty bucks, and, and I think they should have. And maybe I, I don't know if we need you know, different folks to go make that ask. I mean, that's all political, and I'll leave that up to you experts. But I, I just think we be um, we should be criticized. If we see this problem and we don't go uh, for more money, that's it for now. Marty, do you mind if I um, say something? No, and then after you, Lee, I have I have some couple things I'd like to, to ask and also comment. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, assure the committee that based on the feedback we received from you at the last meeting, we did go back and amend the legislative priorities memo going forward to the board later today to include a seeking a fee increase precisely for this purpose. So we've definitely heard that loud and clear and it is addressed in the priority document that you will be asked to vote on later today. I would just say just from um, my own perspective and I think I'm, I probably shared this position with uh, RSL and Justin, with respect to uh, taking all of the factors into account, uh, including our fiscal realities and and the optics, which I think are really important. I personally would recommend uh, that we pursue scenario two, not three, um, because I think it's very challenging for the board to adopt a budget that uses virtually all of our general fund reserves. Um, now, that being said, those aspects of scenario three that actually are programmatic and drive forward our mission, that's the 2201 program, the additional IT services, we could take the committee's uh, direction here 
and say it's scenario two as amended to include any of the um, strategic or mission oriented initiatives from scenario three. So essentially growing the deficit in scenario two. Because if you really look carefully, the bulk of scenario three, those costs are related to full funding of the San Francisco building. Scenario two assumes that we are gonna sell the building within the first six months of the year. So the, really the way we generate much of that as the increase in the deficit for scenario three is because we're assuming we're not selling the building. Um, we have Steve, Steve here, he can give a brief update on, on the sales status. I, I, I think it's reasonable to, for us to assume that we will sell it. I, I'm not sure about the sales price, <laughs> um, but I, I, I think we will know more certainly in the next several months and we could do a budget adjustment say at the mid-year based on the status of the building uh, sale, whether or not it was sold or not. And at that time, make a decision. Are we gonna, you know, we haven't sold the building. It looks like we may not sell it for the balance of the year. Then we make a decision, are we gonna cut the budget to address the need to fully fund uh, operating costs for the San Francisco building? Or at that time, are we gonna vote to increase use of reserves at the mid-year? So um, that's just my my staff view about an alternate approach uh, to this. Leah, and I think I think maybe you, you meant scenario one, where that's the $5 million uh, use of reserves, about half of it, one. right? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm not uh, tracking the paraprint. I mean, yeah, yeah. use of 5 million of the reserves. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Very good. Um, you know, I'm gonna weigh into this uh, a little bit myself here. And uh, I just tell you that um, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the comments of uh, both staff and my colleagues as it relates to uh, to this item. Because this is, a, this is a very serious matter. And I, I pre appreciate the seriousness, which we're all uh, sort of deliberating it and, uh, and the expertise that you all bring uh, to, uh, to, to this discussion. Uh, I like the fact that uh, uh, there were comments made uh, that we need to stay true to our mission. Uh, I like the fact that there were comments made that you know, we have to honor uh, uh, the contract that, uh, that we've uh, negotiated with, uh, with our labor force. Uh, I like the fact of, uh, that we've had a a uh, good discussion about what uh, an appropriate sort of uh, reserve level is, as well as the need to sort of set the stage for, uh, you know, a, a pending conversation and a, and a very serious conversation that we need to have uh, with the legislature, legislature regarding our fee structure and the need for, uh, for a fee increase. Um, you know, as, as many of you know, I spent a lot of time in the state legislature, and so uh, I've, I've done this dance quite often as it relates to budgets. Uh, where we have deficits, uh, and if I was in the legislature right now, uh, and, and many of you may have heard that uh, they're they're looking at a twenty-two billion dollar uh, deficit in the state budget uh, uh, this year, um, and the way that uh, we always approach those things was uh, cuts, um, revenues, and do differently. What are things that we can do differently? Uh, and um, if uh, if, I, my, if the members would just sort of indulge me for, for a little bit, I do have a couple of questions uh, because, uh, and, and maybe just right from the outset, I would say that um, uh, I'm somewhere between um, uh, the 5 million and the, uh, the 8 million. So somewhere between uh, scenario one and scenario three is where, where, my, where my head is. Because I, I feel like um, there may be some things, as, as Ms. Wilson just sort of outlined, that we may be able to, uh, to tinker with a little bit that may, may allow us to still achieve what we need to do from a mission standpoint, um, uh, but not, maybe not cut as deeply into the, into the reserves. It may, it may, we may be nickel and diamond here a little bit, but I, I do have some questions along, uh, uh, along, that, re, uh, along that regard. And, and one of the questions is in, in the other options, and that is the freezing of positions. And um, I, I, my question is, if we were to freeze for six months hiring, does that, in, in, the, in what has been presented, does that also include the four OCTC positions as well uh, as, as being frozen? And um, so that's, that's one part of that question. And the second part of that question is what operationally we see that would really be hampered or hindered if we uh, if we froze a certain number of positions for six months. 
but froze the hiring process for six months. Maybe, let me be clear. I'm not saying stopping the hiring process. I'm actually saying not hiring those positions. So we can go through whatever we need to do in terms of hiring, but there would be a certain date by which folks uh, would actually uh, walk through the doors as employed. Mm -hmm. as, as part of the presentation, we tried to give dollar amounts to that. So for the OCTC positions, we gave you kind of a dollar amount. It's included in that particular scenario. And the same thing for the hiring freeze. What we did for the hiring freeze is we took a snapshot. Obviously, we can't predict you know, real time what positions are vacant. And holding the, taking a snapshot, this was probably in November of vacant positions. And how, how if we didn't hire them for six months, which is a significant savings because you're saving salary benefits, all sorts of things compounding. It was about $800,000 at that time. Obviously things have changed a little bit. And the, the issue with hi hiring freezes is you never know what's gonna be impacted. Because if we do a hiring freeze and, and we have unanticipated, you know, you don't know where it's gonna target or hurt the organization um, with that approach. But the, uh, we we did kind well, of cost it out. But, but just, I'm, I'm pushed back on a little bit, but we should, right? We should know. We know where they're, we know what positions we need to be hiring for. So we know what parts of the organization are gonna be impacted by not hiring uh, you know, those, those positions. So there is, there's some sense of who's gonna be impacted. And I guess that's what I'm asking is, is what, what parts of the organization are we, are going to be Im impacted. I do not want to impact OCTC, but I do want to have a better understanding of what, what other parts of the organization might be impacted by a hiring freeze. Because OCTC comprises the largest majority of our positions, in order to realize the level of uh, savings identified in the presentation associated with the six-month hiring freeze, you'd have to implement, um, you'd have to apply that hiring freeze to OCTC as well. If you didn't, you wouldn't realize that level of savings. Understood. The committee could direct us to, um, you know, as one factor in developing the budget, build in a hiring uh, freeze, a six month freeze, or a requirement that a vacant positions stay open six months before they could be filled other than positions in OCTC. And we couldn't give you, I don't think it's exact dollar amount of what um, that would generate, but I can just give in rough order of magnitude, I think it would be a half to a little bit slightly more than half than the number uh, in the in the PowerPoint presentation, but that could be a policy direction from the committee. Got it. And and trustee soul, and if you want to know the numbers behind what makes up that eight hundred thousand, there was about there was at that snapshot there was three OCTC positions, there was four Office of General Counsel positions, there was two HR positions, one State Bar Court position, a couple of IT positions, and then some in regulation and MAD. So it was it was spread throughout the different organizations. So I didn't mean to say that we don't actually know those numbers. We do because that's how we came up with the number, but. I was saying that that was a snapshot in November. We've continued to have operations. So I don't know. There have been other vacancies and other hirings since we took that snapshot. Got it. Uh, one of the things that I noted in um, uh, the board packet, it wasn't in the presentation, but in the board packet, is that um, uh, in the, I, I think it may be included in sort of the IT um, uh, line item, is that there were some, uh, renovations that were going to be made in the San Francisco courtroom or those sorts of things like that. And I was kind of wondering, I, I, I never having been to the San Francisco office or any of those sorts of things like that, uh, my my initial sort of thoughts were, if we're getting ready to sell a building, why are we why are we making some renovations in it? And uh, I mean, these these may be sort of minimal costs, but uh, just sort of wondering, is that is that still a part of the the scenario structure here as well? So, uh, already a couple of things. I, I ha asked uh, Michelle Crampton, our court administrator, to be able to speak to that issue in addition to Steve Mazur. Um, while we're waiting for Michelle to join us, George has stepped up to the table here, and I, I think he wants to give a little more um, flavor to the response on the impact of holding positions vacant. So, go ahead, George. Yeah, so I mean, I think as everybody knows, over the last year, we tried to fill as many of our positions as we could to try and get up to full staffing so that we reflect that. We've essentially accomplished that, which is why there's a limited number of OCTC vacancies now. What we're looking at now is basically just turnover for attrition. In terms of the effect of a six month freeze, <clears throat> we on our own for in particular our investigators and attorneys 
have shifted to kind of periodic hiring throughout the year. In other words, we are trying to hire not as positions become vacant, but hire and identify candidates, but then have them come on board at regular somewhere between three and four month intervals so that we can do a consolidated training at that time. So in effect, a, a freeze to six months would sim simply shift that periodic training out to be semi-annual instead of on a more frequent basis. So the impact might actually be um, less on our operations than you might think um, if you were to go to something like that. The second thing I wanted to mention was the four OCTC positions. Obviously, we're in a somewhat unusual position in OCTC in that you know, another agenda item that's going to be on the board's agenda today is the legislative analyst's report relating to the SB 211 proposal, which includes a staffing analysis and a suggestion that that get put off for some period of time. Um, we had requested four positions, which was essentially one attorney and three administrative staff. You know, of those, um, more important to me would be at least the ability to bring on two of the administrative staff. We could live without the attorney and the additional, uh, in other words, we could go to two of those positions as opposed to four um, if that's necessary. Those two, I think, would be you know, primarily to support, um, in particular, our, our enhanced procedures relating to client trust account um, investigations. Um, so that's another thing I will throw out um, for consideration um, that we could go to two instead of four. And I say that knowing that in the future we're going to be doing a staffing analysis. Um, we're also contemplating some organizational and structural changes um, that might also impact. Uh, so if you want to consider that as well, I'll just throw that out there. Um, for us, more important are some of the things I've talked with Leah. A number of the IT improvements would be particularly important for us, and my understanding is that those are, in fact, now included in uh, most of the scenarios. And I can just... Try that again. Um, just Ani, to answer your question, um, related not just to the courtrooms, but to any IT spending that's sort of on hardware and physical stuff. Um, anything that is included um, on our list is stuff that we would take with us when we go. It's not sort of built into the infrastructure uh, that would then be, you know, we would not be making just a, a, a short term investment and then have to um, sort of do it all over again. It's stuff that we feel needs to be upgraded now for operations related to both the courtrooms and some other things uh, for our general IT infrastructure, but it's physical stuff that we can carry with us to our uh, to our next uh, premises, wherever that will be. Thank you for that. Michelle, is that what you were going to, you were going to add as well? I, I, yes, I was actually going to say that, but I was going to add a little more context for your understanding and, and to provide a little bit of clarification on what the um, updates would, would entail. Please. So thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the judges and the staff of the court. So to clarify, the budget item is really about routine maintenance. And uh, the last time the San Francisco AV systems were updated was 2015, and that equipment was given a life expectancy of five years. So the equipment that we have in the two San Francisco courtrooms now have far exceeded like end of life. Um, they were supposed to, those two quorums were supposed to be updated in 2020, but those updates were obviously delayed due to the pandemic. And by 2022, however, that's when the court formally transitioned to the more permanent remote and hybrid proceedings for the majority of court events. Uh, just last year, in recent months, two of the four courtrooms in Los Angeles were updated to accommodate remote and hybrid court, court events. Hybrid meaning some of the parties are in the courtroom, some of the parties are remote, much like this board meeting today. Um, the other two courtrooms in LA are scheduled to be upgraded as soon as the equipment is received, which has been on order. Um, in the meantime, San Francisco courtrooms continue to experience regular hardware and software failures that have impacted the ability for us to conduct court events. Just yesterday, for example, uh, IT staff and court staff spent several hours with one of the vendors trying to fix a simple microphone issue that was going to prevent us from holding that court event. It took hours to resolve that issue, and that's because as I said, that equipment has reached end of life. So we're talking about uh, just uh, routine equipment updates. Um, funding the San Francisco courtrooms in the 2023 budget would complete the work that should have happened in 2020 had the pandemic not occurred. 
Um, lastly, it would eliminate the disparities between the two court venues. LA has been updated, San Francisco has not, uh, which would uh, give parties in both locations equitable due process. And to kind of bring it home, I'll just leave you with this. So imagine trying to conduct today's board meeting, the one we're all sitting in right now, in the current hybrid environment with the equipment that we had in these meeting rooms three years ago. You just, you couldn't do it. You couldn't have this meeting with the equipment that we had three years ago. That's that's the situation that the court is in now in San Francisco. So thanks for the opportunity to provide that additional information. I, I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate the, the, the clarifications of Steve Ann uh, and, and Michelle. That, that, that was helpful. That Thank was you very much. Um, uh, let me go down one other sort of line of questioning, and that is, uh, and, and just for, for members, just so you know, one of the reasons why I, I want to make sure that we, we do this is because I want to make sure that there is um, sort of no, no question about the, the deliberations that we went through as well as the due diligence that we, that we went through in, in terms of when we arrive at the recommendation that we're going to make to the full board as well as uh, that will help us into, in the case that we need to make sure that we're, I'll use, I know I'm not a lawyer, I'll use a legal term, uh, that we that we have to prosecute in order to try to get a fee increase, okay? And so, uh, and so that's some of the, the reasoning behind uh, some of my questioning. And so uh, the last thing, without, without going into a whole lot of detail, I've, I've got at least asked, in the IT world, I mean, I know that uh, there, was a, there were a number of attachments that, were, uh, that are provided uh, to this uh, particular uh, to, to I agenda item. And I've got to at least ask, is there anything that uh, uh, the, there's any wiggle room around? Well, there's always wiggle room. It's just a matter of uh, you know what is on the list um, to fulfill the priorities that we've set and what gets pushed to a lower priority. So I'm here with Hatem Kalik. He's our IT manager who runs the uh, procurement side uh, of IT and can get into more uh, specifics. But you know we the we bucketed things on the list here to sort of make distinguishing between you know the recurring hardware software licensing and maintenance that's what we sort of internally sure. refer to as, you know keeping the lights on this is the stuff we already have the hardware the subscriptions the licensing for all of that so most of that is is for the most part not really negotiable because it is stuff that is just you know the core of our basic um operations. We have some other buckets here. We intentionally sort of divided it this way so that decisions could be made uh, if necessary. So, you know, there are some additional hardware uh, purchases that are recommended, again, to um, get things up to a higher standards, equipment that is failing, things that are end of useful life. But, you know, potentially we could figure out, you know, deferring that uh, purchase for some period of time and potentially see if we could uh, manage without it. It does also include some contingency baked in for just stuff that we might plan for if, you know, unexpectedly something should fail, which does happen, but it might not happen. So there is a little bit of wiggle room uh, in there. The IT security and infrastructure initiatives, there are things on that list that potentially um, could be uh, cut or deferred, but IT recommends that we not defer them because they are sort of integral to our, our not just our regular operations, but all of the, the, the security um, behind those operations. So IT would sort of strongly prefer that those items sort of be maintained in the budget, and they are already included in the, in the $5 million reserve plan. And then the strategic priority, um, you know, we do have a new five-year strategic plan, which if you look at the entirety of that five-year plan, you know, yields uh, a very, very long list of, of IT uh, projects that would be required to support them. What we've done here is select from that in incredibly long uh, list the key ones that are sort of the highest priority that fulfill our mission, that, that support the strategic plan, and that serve other, uh, other interests. So, you know, potentially that is, you know, a place where individual projects could be reviewed and we could, you know, make decisions sort of um, up or down on some of those. I, I would not generally be asking for the board's guidance on sort of specific IT projects, because, um, you know, if we are going to have to cut something, I would prefer that IT be able to sort of thoughtfully um, figure out which ones would be would be cut. So we would be hoping for more sort of budget guidance as opposed to sort of specific uh, line item guidance, uh, if you would be amenable to, to that approach. Before I go on, I would just ask uh, any 
any of uh, the comments that have been made or anything prompting any additional questions or comments from members of the committee? Seeing none. Um, I think here's I think I think here's where I am. Uh, I tend to lean. I tend to be in the Mark Tony camp in terms of wanting to lean towards um, uh, you know using um, sort of scenario three. Am I, am I right? Is that that's scenario three correct? The eight million dollar. Yes, scenario yes. three. However, here's what I here's what I would suggest. Um, and um, uh, I would suggest that instead of the full year of funding for uh, 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 the, the San Francisco operations, uh, that we go from six to nine, we go to nine months, all right? That should save us, you know, you know several hundred thousand dollars. And then um, I would also, um, I, I don't know what this translates to, but George's comments sort of resonated with me, and it sounded it sounds like there is some portion of a, of a freeze uh, that would um, uh, almost be a part of the natural cadence of the current operations, and uh, would suggest that we we do something um, that uh, um, that is in line with freezing uh, the hiring of, uh, for uh, for a period of time. Trustee Soul, I just want to make a comment that the hiring freeze that we talked about was an addition. We normally budget a 15% um, salary savings because of natural attrition. So to do a hiring freeze is an addition to that. So we do kind of take in, into account that we're going to have about a 15% you know, okay. turnover rate every year. Okay. So the hiring, for, okay. I get you. I get you. So you know, I was looking to, to see if we could get somewhere between a half a million and, and a quarter of a million dollars back into our reserve based on, uh, you know, what it is that I was putting forward. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. But I would say that um, uh, I would like to whittle um, that, uh, that scenario three, that eight million down, you know, maybe by just a little based on, you know, let's maybe we go from... Uh, from less than, you know, not a full year of funding for the San Francisco office, but maybe nine months, nine months of funding for the San Francisco office and sort of take a look at it, you know, uh, when, when we need to take a look at it after that. That'll probably put us somewhere in the neighborhood of seven something. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, if other members of the committees have, uh, have issues with that or, or are concerned about that. Uh, I know it's kind of nickel and diamond, but, um, but it seems like it, it uh, it's a little bit of a tweener that might save us a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and then the, um, the last thing I think I, that I need to have a better understanding of is it sounds like as a finance committee, um, we want to pass this discussion on to the, uh, to the full board. But is there, uh, this is a discussion item, it's not an action item. And I, I guess I'm just wondering, um, how I how I go about doing that is the uh, how we go about doing that, that as uh, as a committee. I think if if this is the um, direction from the committee, if I'm essentially hearing um, start with the eight million and perhaps make some adjustments, nine versus twelve months of uh, funding for the building, for example, and then potentially play around with a bit of um, position freezing. We can take a, take a look at that. I, what I might suggest is, um, and I would have to ask the chair, but that we take this budget item up tomorrow morning, giving staff the opportunity to do a little bit of modeling with that scenario. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were serious. All right. A, a little bit of modeling with that scenario, and then we can bring that to the board um, for discussion, Arnie. Scenario three with a few adjustments per this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't, uh, since this is not an action item, I'm, I, I can't really see the, see the room and, and see what else is, is, is happening in the room. But I, I want to wonder if my colleagues in the room and Mr. Knoll, if, if, if you're okay moving forward with that, or if there's something else that, uh, that, that members of the committee would like to put forward. Well, I think that a number of folks had, have given how they feel and, um, Mr. Tony has talked about his evolve, not evolvement, and you made some good 
remarks and, and, and ask some good questions. I think Leah's uh, recounting of kind of <clears throat> where you are is probably the best way for us to go to the board and have this full discussion. I don't know if there are going to be people at the full board who are going to have deep-seated ideas about the budget. Or, yeah, I just don't know. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, those of us that are very concerned about uh, the legislature that has been spending like crazy and in, in good ways, I don't mean that it wasn't socially responsible or socially social justice oriented. But I, I, I think when they give us a lot of things to do that they should be willing and more than willing, they should take the lead on paying us um, and to do that. Um, and instead of waiting for us to fail because you've given us assignments that we don't have with the staff or the IT infrastructure or whatever in order to uh, complete the test uh, timely and appropriately. But no, I, I think you've done a really good job uh, making this discussion happen. And let's take it to a full board the way Leah uh, suggested. Other, other members of the committee okay with that? Sounds good to me. Yeah, I certainly don't mind it in looking at this some more, of course, but <clears throat> I would tend more towards um, scenario one or two, somewhere in there. I really hesitate um, to have those reserves down to $2.2 million. To me, that's, that's just too low. So again, I'm hoping we're able to find somewhere between one and two or three. You got it. Um, so, I guess to close this one out, uh, we'll take this up to uh, we'll take this up tomorrow morning. Allow the staff to do a little bit more modeling to try to whittle whittle back that reserve uh, reserve whittle down the or increase the reserve amount a little bit more. Um, there'll be a discussion of this at the full board, but if I'm not mistaken, we still will have to come back for an action item uh, sometime later in the month of February. So there's we'll, uh, to Mr. Brown's point. I think you're going to get it. We're going to get a couple more bites at the apple on this one. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Very good. I know that there is a, another part to this item, and that is the uh, the, the spending authority. Um, Mr. Noble, I am told that you need to recuse yourself. Yes. From yes. This thank item. you very much. I'll, I'm I, I'm going to leave right now, so that I'm not in the discussion about it as well as the vote. The reason is because there are grants involved, I'm told, in uh, in that spending authority. Very good. And so if unless there are questions, additional questions for our Selly associated with that or Ms. Wilson associated with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion to um, uh, to deal with this spending authority issue for the this interim period of time into February. Mamie, do you want to put up the resolution really quick? Committee members, do we feel like we need to go over this some more or are folks okay? I can't see, so I don't know if there's a, a hand raised or if there's a, a motion that's been made at this point or someone wanting to make a motion. Yeah, yeah it, just clarification on this. Um, What I support, look, what I support is uh, giving the spending authority um, okay, okay, I'm gonna tell you what I support. I support that through the month of February, 
that that the um, you know state bar staff has the authority to pay the bills, right? What I'm not clear is if February 1st, I'm not sure that that's the right day. It seems like we want to have this authority last until February 28th, right? Not until February 1st. It, that's the start date. Yeah. Be, because the board already ah, came. Ah, okay, right. okay. It was unclear. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And clarification on the amount? We're not saying you want to... You don't intend to spend $75 million before the end of, of a $95 million budget by the end of February, right? I'm just trying to figure out where the $75 million comes in. I think we do. Uh, this is primarily grant funding not included in the numbers we've been talking about today. Correct, correct. Yes. Very good. That helps me. <laughs> the, uh, the, we're, we're little apples and oranges. So this is oranges, which is cool from the apples we just talked about. I just have to shift. So I am prepared to make this motion now that I have the clarification. Sorry. And I'll second it. Very good. Ms. Harvey, will you call the roll, please? Broughton? Yes. Soel? Aye. Tony? Aye. And that's three, four, none against. Motion carries. Very good. Um, we need to try to get Mr. Noel back um, because I know we have just uh, one additional item uh, to discuss and hopefully we can do that in, um, in short order. And I just wanna once again sort of thank the staff for all the work that they did on the, the budget scenarios and, and, and prep for uh, questions from board members. So. I appreciate you for that. Thank you. We've reached out to Mr. Knoll. You know what, in the interest of time, uh, why don't we go ahead and start uh, the presentation? Um, uh, let's give Mr. Knoll, we'll, we'll, we'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll start in maybe 30 seconds, okay? Okay. So we get him. I, I don't have a presentation item. This one will be rather quick. So, this is just, and this, um, this, this is an action item, though. Right? This is an action item, correct. correct. When you've lost your quorum, <laughs> <laughs> there's been mutiny in the room. So, we'll let you know when, when it's back. <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. Just so recording for now and then resume once we have a quorum. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we're now recording. Very good. Um, Finance Committee is, is back. Um, and uh, Ms. Montoya Chico, would you proceed to item number B, please? Sure. So this this last item is our uh, the annual review of the investment policy, um, you know, per the board manual. Uh, the finance committee is to review uh, the investment policy on an annual basis. It is also part of the finance committee work plan. Um, I, I don't have a presentation. You know, there's really minimal changes um, that I am proposing to the investment policy. Um, and those are documented in the agenda item. And those two are, <clears throat> are just the addition of a small paragraph uh, that incorporates a uh, you know, section on, on social investments. Um, and I've also updated the listing of allowable investments to align with um, the California, the state of California investment policy, which is what we follow. So those two, um, those two revisions or, or proposed changes are in your red line um, that's in the attachment of, of the agenda item. And those are, are the only changes that um, I am proposing as part of the annual review of, of the investment policy. So if, if there's any, any comments or questions I can answer. The questions from Finance committee members. I don't see any. Over the years, I know this has been a bit of a fairly pro forma item. You know, mm -hmm. I do appreciate Araceli, uh, the addition of uh, of the uh, of the 
the red line issues that you uh, that, that you indicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I continue to always be be looking for more opportunities for us to try to uh, you know, make some of our investments with uh, uh, you know smaller financial institutions, uh, financial institutions of color, uh, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think this is in keeping with uh, uh, with that effort. Yeah. And I do, I do, you know, there is more work uh, that, that we do want to do uh, around this uh, investment policy and, and DEI and, and ESG uh, values uh, that, you know, we will incorporate, you know, in a subsequent uh, later, later on. So there is more work to do. Uh, but for now, this is all the revisions that I'm proposing um, today. So, Happy to entertain a motion. Mimi, can you put up the resolution, please? I'll move the item. I'll second the item. And so with that, um, Ms. Harvey, we call the roll. Bratton. Michael. Bratton. I don't know if his mic is on. Put it that's a yes. Yes. Did you get Thank it? you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Three yeses for me. <laughs> uh, Tony. I. Soil. I'm an I, and I. I take it we I'm haven't gotten Mr. Noel back no. yet. Huh? No, he has not entered yet. Okay. Returned yet. Very good. You, you can go ahead and announce the vote, vote Ms. Harvey. Okay, that is three, four, none against, motion carries. Very good. Um, I think I, uh, good work committee members. I think that includes our business of, of the finance committee for today. Um, if I am correct, uh, the, the, the full board meeting is supposed to start, is it 1230 we're supposed to start? That's correct. Okay, all right. Um, I don't think there's any, I, I don't think, think I have to adjourn or anything like that, do I? I think we're good, right? All right, yes. thank you. Thank you.